as it provides an opportunity for the major stakeholders in the federal government fighting against corruption to give account of their stewardship and for Nigerians who have the opportunity to interact with them, ask them questions and also make suggestions. This way, we can all be on the same page as far as this war of survivor is concerned. Once again, honorable ministers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for taking the time to be here for this town hall meeting. But before I call my panelists, I must not fail to appreciate the efforts of the National Orientation Agency, the organization that's actually the power behind all our town hall meetings. We will now take presentations from our panelists. After, it, after that, we will take questions and comments from the audience. Both of the forms have either been stolen or mismanaged, leaving us with infrastructure that is grossly inadequate to support a modern economy. Today I read in the papers. In the last 10 years, $10 billion have been stolen, I mean $40 billion have been stolen due to oil theft. So it is so real that, like the president said, if we don't kill corruption, it is going to kill us. Now, it is in recognition of this that President Muhammad Buhari's administration decided to focus, among other things, on the war against corruption. Because the president has powers under the, he has a duty under the constitution to ensure that abuse of power and corrupt practices are abolished. And that power also of the president includes maintenance of all laws of the federation, which includes anti-corruption laws. So that is the legal basis. Now, the attorney general is the chief law officer whose duty it is to coordinate the implementation and enforcement of all these laws. So the, 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 the battle against corruption, therefore, rests solely, squarely on the head of the Attorney General. Because in fighting corruption, it has to be legally done in line with international best practices. Even when we have found someone who is a known thief, we cannot just stick him on the road and send him to jail. Procedures under the law must be followed. So the Attorney General in this regard has done a lot by setting up the Nigerian National Anti-Corruption Strategy. The anti-corruption strategy was signed by FEC in July 2017, and it is resting on five pillars. And the pillars are prevention of corruption, to which the focus is to reduce gaps and vulnerabilities. Corruption is so alluring that if you don't deal with it technically, and professionally and effectively, efficiently, you are not likely going to achieve any results. So, when someone is entrusted with funds and he knows that he can help himself with it without checks, without consequences, the chances that the person will do so is very high. So, one of the focus is to prevent. And how have we done this? There are policies of the government like the BVN policy, which prevents the opening of fictitious accounts and accounts in, you know, in non-existing names, thereby facilitating corruption. We enforced the implementation of that policy effectively through the banking system. The IPPIS, which brings all the public servants and public officers within the basket of one salary payment, so that it is not possible for someone to be earning salaries from 10 places. There are other policies of the government's preventive measures, like the TSA. Before agencies of government can have a million accounts that are outside the, the purview of any regulatory agency, but because of the TSA, everyone has been constrained to put all their funds in, in a common post, which is visible and makes it easier to, I mean, for oversight purposes. So the next pillar again, is enforcement of sanctions. This administration has 
without uh, sounding vain glorious or trying to blow our trumpets, we have tried to effectively enforce anti-corruption sanctions against even politically exposed persons. Persons who ordinarily are untouchables by Nigerian uh, arrangements. The president, because of his political will, focused on this class of persons and I mean, we all know what has happened in recent past. Another pillar is public enlightenment. And this is what we are doing here this morning. The war against corruption cannot, all the anti-corruption agencies are well represented here. We have been talking about it. But we know that if we do not hone the law, I mean the war, if Nigerians do not see it as an existential battle, which they must also be part of, is not likely going to succeed. And that is why we have this uh, arrangement, this meeting this morning, to carry everybody along, to hold the battle. This is our country. We do not have any other place to go. We see videos on social media where people talk about other countries, saying Nigeria is this, Nigeria is that. It should prick our hearts, and we should know that we have to be patriotic. So this is the essence of public enlightenment, which the Office of the Attorney General is also championing. Also connected to public enlightenment is campaign for ethical reorientation. Historically in Nigeria, we have a, an ethnic, I mean ethnic disposition against corruption. In Yoruba they say if someone is a thief, no matter what he's wearing tomorrow, he is also he is still a thief. And that is the, 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 the perception that people will have of him. So at what point did we lose it? At what point we have now become a people who have placed so much emphasis on money? So we need to reorientate ourselves and deconstruct money, which we have placed premium upon. So it's one of the pillars that we are driving. And also, one of the next pillar is recovery of, of stolen funds. If people have stolen so much, and the government is not able to disgorge them of the ill stolen wealth. The war against corruption is nothing. Because they have a big war chest to destroy the war, to thwart it, and deal with it. So in this regard, to the office of the Attorney General, the President signed the Presidential Executive Order No. 6 of 2018. By the provisions of this Presidential Executive Order, every anti-corruption agency are under a duty to ensure that with respect to any investigation or, or litigation bordering on corruption, assets involved must be protected. And the threshold is 50 million naira. So historically, when people have stolen so much in billions, you take them to court, they even have so much money to buy a shwebi. Every time the matter is coming up, they sponsor troops to come and drum for them. So it has lost the steam. So we feel if we allow people to still have access to these funds, through which they can make a mess of the whole system, corrupt the judges, corrupt the investigators, then we are joking. So through the Office of the Attorney General, we designed that order signed by the President to ensure that those class of persons do not have access to the funds in issue. And it has been so effective. People who either too were so, you know, bold about the battle against them, they are now coming forward to say, okay, I've stolen 650 million. I want to return everything so that I can have peace. Because we have more or less changed the strategy in the war against corruption. So, also the Office of the Attorney General has been seriously involved in the effective implementation of the Administrative of Criminal Justice Act of 2015. The act, in, in a way, revolutionized criminal prosecution in Nigeria. And the, uh, the Attorney General of the Federation is the one in charge of, I mean, providing oversight and guidance over the implementation of that law. We are collaborating with other anti-corruption agencies because we cannot, we have realized that we cannot work in silos. We, we, we have created an ecosystem through which we can share data. It doesn't make any sense if the subject is anti-corruption. 
ICPC or Professor Wasonye is investigating, spending taxpayers' monies in millions of naira, and also EFCC is doing the same thing. So we have ensured a, a collaborative framework through which all the anti-corruption agencies can share data, information, and work together. So as a result of all this, we have recovered in excess of 200 billion. I mean, in final forfeiture. There are recoveries that are still in terror, which we cannot deal with, but they have been effectively protected. But the monies that we have earned for the federal government in this process is in excess of 200 billion. Uh, notable among these are the $325 million Abacha recovery. We also recovered $75 million connected to the Malabu transaction. So, without taking much of our time, uh, in a nutshell, this is what the Office of the Attorney General has been doing to ensure that the war against corruption is carried out in a coordinated, effective, efficient manner in line with international best practices and the rule of law. In the, in the future, we are planning to do more. We want to leverage technology in the fight against corruption. So we want to create enabling legislation and laws to permit the use of technology in the fight against corruption so that it can be more efficient. Thank you so much and God bless. For the omission at my opening remarks about the passes of the president to fight against corruption on assuming office, we were established in 2015 and we were given extensive powers and extensive mandate and one of the terms of reference of the committee is to intervene comprehensively in the fight against corruption. And uh, our understanding as academics and as, th as a think tank for the government regarding the fight against corruption is to disaggregate and find out then if we are to intervene comprehensively in the fight against corruption, what can we do within the country to fight corruption? What can we do outside the country in the fight against corruption? We have realized that corruption is a transborder crime. People salt our resources from Nigeria and take it abroad. Therefore, the fight against corruption will not have to stay or begin and end in Nigeria. As a result of that, we engaged in quite a number of intellectual activities, including a lot of interface with all the anti-corruption agencies, so that we can have a lot of synergy regarding what the anti-corruption agencies do. Like the representative of the AG has said, working in silos will not help the fight against corruption. And therefore, part of what we did up initial was to ensure that there is a platform for sharing information. And that is why we developed you know, the protocol for sharing information between and among the anti-corruption agencies because, like he said, duplicating efforts will amount to wasting resources. Then again, we developed the manual on PLIB again. Then we realized that a lot of resources are being confiscated, some get wasted in the process. Mm -hmm. Then we developed guidance notes regarding asset management, beginning from what is perishable to money, animals, and all manner of things. In essence, the committee developed a lot of materials to guide the nation regarding the fight against corruption. We made a lot of input relating to the national anti-corruption strategy, which is now being operated in Nigeria. Therefore, as a think tank, as an advisory body that has the ears of the president, we have done quite a lot that is visible. However, there are things that are not visible which we have done, we have documented, and we have passed on to the president. And that is not for maybe public consumption. But going forward, can we say um, 
there are no problems with the fight against corruption, even though we have achieved, we have achieved a lot. A lot of progress has been done. Are we there yet? Well, one can say, no, we are not there yet. Even though we are not where we were, but we are not where we want to be. Therefore, the journey goes on. The battle against corruption will go on. So what are those areas that in a town hall meeting like this, we should pay our attention to so that concerted efforts can be made to ensure that the battle is won. For us as a committee, we feel to actually succeed in the fight against corruption, you must wholeheartedly and sincerely carry the bar and bench along. They must key very much into the fight against corruption. There shouldn't be any way, any two ways about it. Especially lawyers must key into the fight against corruption. That you are either an it or you are not. There shouldn't be in between. Why? Because along the process we have realized that all manner of corrupt practices in Nigeria happen because of laxities in our professions. Lawyers, accountants, bankers, bankers, auditors, architects. By the time you have professionals that respect the ethics of their profession, possibility is corruption will be very, very minimal. But here we are with professionals without professionalism. So I feel lawyers, judges must help this country and ensure that legally speaking we battle the corruption we have in Nigeria. But we have realized that it takes a lot of time to go into litigation because of dilatory tactics and many other delay methodologies. Therefore, we have been part of the process to encourage, uh, to encourage non-conviction based asset forfeiture regime. And in this regard, I am very happy Professor Bolaji is here. He will, I'm sure he will talk extensively on that. Now the action will go after the property, not the individual, so that at least the human rights community can keep quiet. Because by the time you arrest the individual, irrespective of the manner of the offense, People shout about human rights without recognizing the rights of the Nigerian people whose properties have been taken. By the time you go after the property, then the individual can come forward and offer explanation. And I think going forward, our anti-corruption agencies have been doing that. That's why we deeply and seriously appreciate Ibrahim Magu for the efforts he has been doing to ensure that to ensure that resources are taken away from looters. It is the global practice today that criminals must not be allowed to benefit from the process of crime. It is the global standard practice. Therefore, going after the individuals will only cause more problems, but going after the property will be the right thing to do. By the time we continue like that and people don't have benefits from the process of crime, possibility is people will be deterred. Now, as a committee, some of us can remember we met the president on the 10th of October. We gave him all the documents we were able to produce. We offered some advices, but we told the president that going forward in this country, the fight against corruption must devolve to states and local governments. Now, a lot of resources have been sent to local governments and the states. Uh, I think 48 to 49 percent of the monthly allocation of the Federation goes to the states and local governments. It's a huge quantum of resources. But while the federal government is doing a lot to fight corruption, to ensure that there is maximum effect regarding the resources of the nation, not much is being done in the state. We talk less of our local governments. Therefore, we feel, as a committee, let us go and see what we can do in the state. In that regard, the committee has gone to at least 11 states. We have found a very good partner in the National Orientation Agency that has platform in each local government, and in fact, they have platform in the wards. 
Therefore, we are taking the message to local governments and the states. Not only because the states have to key into the fight, but because local governments are collecting their monies directly. Therefore, we have to pay attention what is being done with the money that they get. And in this regard, I will call on at least governors that are part of the ruling party will have no any excuse whatsoever not to join the fight against corruption. I can understand if an opposition party says it's not going to be part of the fight against corruption, but I can't understand why and how a party that is part of the ruling party will not key into the fight against corruption in the states and local governments. Therefore, the fight against corruption as agreed by the president as mandated to us will continue, will collaborate with all the anti-corruption agencies and will do our best to advise, the, to advise the president in the fight against corruption. Now, finally, I must talk about our efforts regarding fighting corruption outside the shores of Nigeria. We have engaged in communications, collaborations, interactions with quite a number of stakeholders outside Nigeria because, like I said, many people steal our resources and go to Europe, Canada, America. Now we have realized that quite a number of people who steal because Europe is now becoming uh, very hot for them. They are now moving to some safe heavens within the African continent like Rwanda, South Africa, and South Africa is becoming untidy for some corrupt Nigerians. People are moving to Rwanda. We are getting to Rwanda. In other words, people who steal the resources of this country must never be allowed to rest within and outside the country. We have every duty, we have every obligation to pursue them, arrest them, and make sure that they face justice within and outside the country. Finally, we want to appeal to countries that are harboring resources belonging to Nigeria. That it's not easy to trace resources stolen. It's not easy, I mean, it's not enough to trace resources stolen. It's not enough to confiscate, but we should ensure that resources are returned quickly and smoothly. Nigeria has a lot of resources in terms of money, buildings, houses, etc., etc., scattered across the world. Our anti-corruption agencies will do a very good job of tracing them, going through the process for confiscation, but then these countries that are safe heavens will make it using one technicality or the other that the return becomes extremely difficult. We have a duty as a government, as a people, as a nation, to ensure that we interface, interact, and if necessary, quarrel with these countries harboring our resources so that the resources are returned to Nigeria. We need them more than they need them. Finally, I want to, I want to extend the best wishes of the chairman. He would have loved to be here, but like I said, myself, Professor Femi Odekule, Professor Itanibi Alenika are here, therefore he's well represented. Please accept his apology. Thank you very much. And, and the police. Every law enforcement agency is primarily established to fight injustice, that's corruption. So it's, it's, it's not like uh, who is, even the army, everybody, every law enforcement agency in this country is primarily, fundamentally established in the fight against corruption. So I think we should also start looking at other law enforcement agencies when there is so much corruption. But we are collaborating with their, we are, their stakeholders. We are working together. And it helps us collaboration, collaborate with the people, with law enforcement agencies in the fight against corruption. Every room, you don't have to do it the way the law enforcement agencies do. Even if you are able to educate the children at home before going to school, that corruption is wrong. We have done it.
you have gone away. I mean, because some people don't even believe corruption is wrong. So I like, uh, I'm not going to tell you too much of your time. I just want to say that it is true that corruption is the greatest problem holding back our country from fulfilling its potentials. It is entrenched in all sectors, in all sectors, but in the last four years, the years back by the political will of President Muhammad Buhari, has through a combination of enforcement and preventive measures, proven that this monster can be tamed. All that is needed is combination of courage, guard, integrity, and determination. Determination. All of us must be determined to fight corruption. At this juncture, it will be helpful that we provide snippet on our effort over the past four years. I want to mention, you know, we have preventive mandate. We have enforcement. We have prosecution. That's that, that's the secret, actually. In some old, but, um, in other law enforcement agencies in some other countries, they can only prevent and they cannot enforce. You have to go to the police, the police will enforce. When it is a uh, prosecution, they go to the Minister of uh, Justice to prosecute. But we can do all. That's why we have one of the highest conviction and this is real you can go and check our website every conviction we get every arrest we make we usually and we have a website where you can see so it's real the law is the law establishes the EFC the law establishing the EFC gives the commission power to make to take measures to prevent corruption and other forms of economic crimes this mandate sits perfectly with the national anti-corruption strategy, as well as uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, UNCAP, Recommendation 60, which requires that about 60% 60, 60 of the effort of anti-corruption should be devoted to preventive measures. I feel very uncomfortable, you know. I, I, a, a professor just spoke before me, and another professor will speak after me. So, um, <laughs> so the EFC has, over the last few years, has executed corruption prevention strategy that targets the most vulnerable segment of the population in the delivery of anti-corruption messages. These are the children, the youth, and the women. Specific programs we've done, I will list them. We have uh, establishment of the integrity clubs in primary schools and tertiary institutions in all sets of the Federation. We have organized organization of Clean Hand Initiative for school children. We have special corruption and cyber crime sensitization for National Youth Service Corps members during their orientation programs. We have an establishment of the anti-corruption community development clubs or call members who are in their post orientation service here. We launched the Women Against Corruption. It's a very helpful program. Hosting of the first ever anti corruption marathon. Hosting active participating in observing the yearly December 9 International Anti Corruption Day. Periodic Corruption Awareness Club Works. Mobilization of an interface committee. We want to bring in the religious leaders into the fight against corruption because they have opportunity to talk to more people. If we carry them along, the message will reach far. So we also work with the religious leaders interface, both Christians and Muslims. And anybody who wants to listen to us, anybody who wants to fight against corruption, irrespective of your religion, you are welcome. A regular town hall stakeholders meeting involves civil society organizations, labor unions, religious leaders, regional leaders, youth organizations, and media 
practitioners and opinion leaders. Sponsorship of special anti-corruption programs on national radio and television. The commission produces the Eagle on radio and TV. Also, there are special programs being aired on radio station in the zones where the commissions have offices. The commission believes that preventing corruption is ultimately more cost effective given the large resources needed in investigating and prosecuting corruption cases. But all citizens must key into this vision for the impact to be fundamental. However, the Commission is determined to fully express its strength to ensure that the monster called corruption is tamed. For this reason, our enforcement activities remain on high alert. Our attraction investors to Nigeria. The, one of our anti corruption strategy is deliberately designed and structured to attract direct investment into this country. Because we discover that uh, a lot of Nigerians we have a high level of human resources working outside this country. Some of them they put a lot of years and they, a lot of savings and uh, they want to come home and invest. Most of them are involved in coming home, back home, and building real estate, and uh, they are get defrauded by their friends, shallow friends, etc. So we are taking it very serious that we um, want to make sure there is a safe haven. We will guarantee that they will come, and we will make sure that where there is a case of defrauding, them we will make sure it is recovered. So it is our duty to also attract investors both within and outside the country. Come and invest. Yes. ESCC have also helped to show this. An example of such investigation is one that is widely referred to as Malabu oil and gas scandal, where we have successfully brought charges against two former ministers for allegedly defrauding Nigeria to the tune of $1.2 billion regarding oil processing losses of PL245. There is also the recent one, $9.6 billion US dollars, process and uh, industrial development PNID limited arbitral award against Nigeria by a UK commercial court. I don't know what would, what, what would have happened. $9.6 billion. If you have $9.6 billion, you end up building hospital in every, if it is judicially handled, you will build hospital, a general hospital, in almost every town in Nigeria. And people want to take it, they want to steal it. It's, it's, it's complete fraud. So we were able to go into the matter very quickly and we were able to establish and um, we brought charges against the, both the P&D in Nigeria and the P&ID in, in, in Europe, in UK, and um, we got the conviction and um, we are in the process of liquidating and we, are, we have also entered, we are working with lawyers outside this country to also go and effect the decision of the court outside this country is allowed. You know, in the area of cyber crimes, cyber investigation, also the EFCC has constantly striven to alter the narratives about Nigeria being a country of fraudsters because it's gradually coming back. You discover that you, uh, the, the harassment of Nigerians at the airport and, and seaport by, by foreign, when you are in the foreign nations is, is, is gradually returning. So we are working with, with a lot of our other law enforcement agencies outside this country and it's adding a lot of value to it. It's, it's been very effective. One thing is that somebody has just mentioned that it's a cross-border crime. Yes. Just like about two weeks ago, at the West African level, ECOWAS level, we have agreed, the head of anti-corruption in West Africa, we have agreed to make a presentation to the Committee of Ministers of ECOWAS 
which presentation will now be placed before the before the head of state sometimes next year maybe around february and when it is effective then we can seemingly we can without any hitch you can go into ghana or any other country where solar money are hidden and we will operate and the, uh, the law enforcement agency in that country will also help us we execute and, 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 and uh, do the, the, the need for So it's, it's very effective. So it, uh, you have no place to go. Yes. Um, of course, Ghana. Uh, most of these fraudsters, these internet fraudsters, Yaku Yaku boys, they have migrated to, to neighboring countries. And we are in touch. Migrated to West African countries. So most of them are in, even, even in, in Dubai. So, so that when they, they hit, they will come back. That was how we are able to get uh, 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 the, the recent frost we arrested, uh, who goes by the name of Monfa, uh, Ismail Isa, and then his Lebanese accomplice, Hamza Kodia. Hamza was arrested on the October 18 at the Nambi Azuke International Airport. Well, he never knew, you know, he, he was in Lagos, he enjoyed himself in Lagos and he came. He wanted to fly out. I didn't know we had that information, so we got him. Eventually, we also got Hamza Kudai. Hamza Kudai is living in the arrest area for the operation Kudai, who lives in a palatial echo Atlantic Peel Tower home in Victoria Island, Lagos. That property, I understand, uh, goes for about $5 million. $5 million is about one point. Uh, I think about 1.5 billion naira. The two sources allegedly under 38, 33 billion naira through three companies with this. And uh, Mustafa laundered about 14 billion naira via 41 bank account. And we recover uh, five research valued about over 60 billion, 60 million dollars we were recovered. Uh, six, five research. I, I remember there was one, we discovered one jewelry. I think this was that is about over, yes, over a million, uh, about 600,000 pounds. One, one research. That was the, the, the case of uh, designing. I cannot remember the details, but uh, so you can see, easy come, easy go. In the area of prosecution, um, in fact, when I was, when we were defending the budget in the in the National Assembly, when a member of the National Assembly saw our our approved budget last year for uh, for legal legal services, and it was just about one hundred and seventy. What? It can't be. You know, um, but we manage the little you have. You manage uh, most of this um, senior advocate of Nigeria. Uh, you know, you, doctor, I hope you are not um, huge amount. You can imagine somebody collecting 1.9 billion dollars or 2. Point something billion dollars for a, for legal services. And when you check the end of that, that uh, you know. It's like uh, people are putting head together, you know, and uh, people don't pay tax. They don't meet up their, their own uh, obligations to the government of the day. So that's it. Now, um, from January, from January this year to October this year, the commission recorded 890 convictions. It's real. It's real. He says the people are there, you, you, you can touch it. That's what I mean, it's real. It's only propaganda. Yes. And this is one of the best in the world. There's no doubt about that. In, 2000, in 2015, we had 103 convictions. 2016 is 189. 2017, 190, 2018, 300, and this. And um, I, I must say that the activities of the presidential anti-corruption committee has helped 
the way they, they, they look at the uh, plea bargain arrangement and also the provisions of the AGJA uh, 2015, as also as said us. And the fact that we had now a larger reach out, we have, uh, we have added about uh, nine zonal offices that I came on board. So that could be the source for the this and, and our insistent uh, having, you know, robbing minds with the judges seem to close some gaps. In the areas of asset recovery, it's key in denying corrupt, corrupt people the enjoyment of the proceed of his or her crime. Her crime. It, it also affords the country the opportunity to channel recovered funds in international development. So since this period, the Commission has recovered several billions. I don't want to come out with any figure here, because nobody can beat. But uh, we have uh, anything we do is quickly, in fact, the, we are not the people who are depressed the people, they, they don't allow us to rest. Anytime there is any conviction, any recovery, you will see them. In fact, most of them are hanging in the courtroom, so that before we even know, they, they, they are already on, on course. Okay, you say I have 30 more minutes, is it? <laughs> okay, the, another area that we came in that was a bit helpful, even though there we have got a lot of blames, is in the area of our board buying activities. We were able to, uh, this we make sure, we were old man, almost all the falling wood, and uh, we were able to at least bring some sanity into this. Somebody mentioned the idea of flaunting wealth, impunity, that have been exhibited by, by the looters. I remember in those days, uh, there was one governor that went to a hotel in, in, in London, and uh, it was his birthday, that day was his birthday. So uh, he just about, he came out about his, his, in front of his room, and uh, anybody that passed by is given a hundred dollars. So uh, at the end of the day, the, there was no, everybody was going for the hundred dollars. So the, everything stopped at the, the, the hotel. The cooks are no longer cooking. The service, uh, they are no longer serving any food. And the people who are working in the, in the, in the restaurants. And it has also checked the issue of uh, some Nigerians, political resource person, going to London in those days. London. They will take over the hotel. They will close down the street. There will be one, uh, one pay. I mean, this, this is their party. And uh, they park motor anyhow. In London, no? they park motor anyhow, crowd anything. This has stopped. Now it's, it's, uh, it's, it has become a burden for them because they don't have any hiding place. Wallahi. They don't have any hiding place. So you see, somebody will go and buy a mansion in London. He will go to London. He will go and stay in a hotel. He will go in a hotel. Then he will come out. He will take a taxi. He will not give that address. So, and he has been paying maintenance fee and uh, tax billions of dollars uh, our money. What's it here? He cannot even go and sleep in that house. Then he will take taxi. The taxi will drop him at some point. He will take another taxi because he doesn't throw that taxi. He doesn't throw that taxi more from his hotel. He will take another taxi. Then he will give the, he won't even give the real address because he knows the place. So when he comes, he will make sure that the driver doesn't watch him on the, in, the, in his mirror. Then the man will pick like this and, 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 and just see the house. He can, he can see it. Yeah. So why don't you bring back this thing? Bring back so that, uh, like the government has agreed uh, in the, this of uh, executive order number six or eight, so that they, they will give you something for you to survive. So this is, this is a waste. Yeah. I think it's a waste, and it has it will way back where uh, the prosecutor uh, this. So I think it's dead. Uh, so we should advise them to return this money, so that it can be given back to the people, because the issue of corruption has aggravated our uh, IDPs this refugee situation very seriously you can go and see a lot of things happening in in the northeast it's, it's deliberate and uh, since money are, are plugged back into uh, bringing a lot of unrest 
in the country because most of these arrests, both in the banditry, even in the Boko Haram, are being funded. I strongly believe that. I strongly suspect that it's being funded by the looters. Because I don't know why they should sustain, they should last up to this time. I want to congratulate my brother for, for making sure that the, the, the borders are blocked. Because I am from my degree, I know it has helped. It has helped to check the exercise of the of the of the uh, of the banditry. Because that thing sustain some of them, that's why they have the strength to go and uh, and, and continue what they are doing. We are also doing a lot of things in, in the area of uh, uh, checking the exercises of the NGOs, NGOs and their, their activities in the war zone areas. We are working with the relevant law enforcement agencies. We believe in partnering with all the law enforcement agencies because nobody can claim monotony, I mean monopoly of knowledge of how to do these things. So it's better done in cooperation with others. We are also cooperating with other law enforcement agencies. Now, uh, very recently, uh, there are a lot of law enforcement agencies that come around. Even yesterday, I received a letter that we have been invited by the Guinean, Guinean government, and uh, we are about putting into training some, some law enforcement, anti corruption agency from Liberia for about two weeks who house them in that. Uh, so it's a, yeah, it's a collaboration both within and outside the country it helps a lot. Um, they say challenges. Sponsors media attack, even violent attacks. Yes, there are a lot of similar.